Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, our discussion focuses on organizations with a deep understanding of how the human-animal bond can improve our physical, social, and emotional lives, particularly in therapeutic settings. With special guests today, Dr. Edward Plack, Executive Director of Green Chimneys, which is based in New York State, Annie Peters, President and CEO of Pet Partners in Bellevue, Washington, and, and Amy Blossom, CEO of the Gala, the Equine Assos- Assisted Growth and Learning Association in Elgin, Illinois. It's wonderful to see you all. This is really an important and growing field. And uh, coming out of the isolation that was engendered by, uh, by COVID, you're seeing people needing some sort of a connection. And very often that connection can come through animals, our pets. We see an explosion in in, uh, in puppies um, and and families with puppies uh, coming out of that kind of isolation. So uh, animals and humans have interactions at the beginning of time and those interactions can have a huge impact. There are situations where humans experiencing trauma or having mental health issues or physical issues or dealing with with aging, just need that kind of nonverbal connection and that sort of unconditional connection that that humans can have with animals on both sides can be incredibly healing. So, um, Ed, let's let's sort of get oriented on your organization, Green Chimneys, your physical plant and the services that you provide. We're going to go around the room, we're going to go to Annie and then Amy, and then let's talk about some of the more uh, complicated aspects of providing these services. Ed? Great, Mark, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, certainly, it is a, a really incredibly important topic. Um, just to give you a little bit of background in regards to Green Chimneys, we're celebrating our 75th anniversary in October, and we have two schools on 700 acres. We have a 200-acre farm as well as a 500-acre forest that has a large lake. And the focus of Green Chimneys is working with youngsters primarily on the spectrum and those that have significant mental health issues. And Green Chimneys is the last stop for most of these children. It's K through 12th grade. We have regents and local diplomas, so we are a state certified school. We have 102 youngsters who live with us and 150 commuters. And all of these children have a variety of disabilities, but all under the umbrella of of mental health. And the beauty of this program that was started in 1947, our founder, Dr. Ross, who has been involved with both organizations that, that are here way back in the 60s and 70s, is that the DNA of our youngsters were missing that nature based piece. So his focus was animals and gardening, as well as outdoor activities. I mean, I'm really pleased that our youngsters are absolutely involved in the daily life and care of over 300 different types of animals. It could be our 22 equines. We have three camels. We have herds of sheep, goat, cows. Uh, We have probably one of the biggest birds of prey rehab center in the country. We rehab about 100 owls, primarily bald eagles, falcons, vultures. Um, That's something that the kids are involved in. Um, So again, we do provide that animal type of therapy with our occupational therapists, our speech and language therapists, psychologists, social workers, but it's way more than that. That's only a slight piece of it. Every child has a job or has responsibility to care for an animal or part of part of our garden. So even though we should come back, we should come back at and talk about the sophisticated nature of providing services that keep animal healthy, animals healthy. There are planning, there are executive function skills, there's, there are financial skills, there are volume. You know, how do you, how do you um, calculate the volume of feed? You have medical care because animals need to get shots, right? That, that whole piece, it just connects to our lives in really fundamental ways. Annie, could you talk a little bit about pet partners? Then we're going to come back to, to Ed and we're going to go through, we're going to deconstruct the competencies that are required and the competencies that are conveyed through your various programs. Annie? Sure, great. It's great to be here, Mark, and nice to be here with these colleagues who share Pet Partners' commitment to both client safety and the highest standards to protect the animals that are engaged in these opportunities. 
So Pet Partners is the leading therapy animal organization. We registered nine species, although primarily our therapy animal teams consist of a handler and a dog. Um, we have the highest commitment to client safety and animal standards concern about the animal's welfare and that they also seem to benefit from the interactions as well. So we have 10,000 teams in the U.S. and 13 countries. 10,000 so uh, 10, uh, 10, teams. 10,000 teams. So you and your pet are a team. Um, and those teams make visits to uh, hospitals, assisted living, reading programs in schools, college de-stress events, hospice, anywhere where people in a vulnerable position might be away from their pet, away from an animal, or benefit from a visit by an animal. So I tell people, if you have a well-behaved golden retriever and you wanna start visiting sick children at Children's Hospital, you would come to Pet Partners. We would educate you, evaluate you and your pet to make sure you're a good team if you pass and we register you and insure you. So that's for lay people, right? People who wanna share their pet. Um, there's also this huge growth in professionals who want to integrate an animal into their practice. Think psychologists, school counselors, occupational therapists, even dentists. Many people go to their dentist's office now, and there's a dog roaming around. And those professionals have not had anywhere to go for their education. Um, they've come to pet partners because our education is the highest in the space of therapy animal visitation. Um, but everything we do is for volunteers. So two months ago, pet partners launched a sister organization, a professional membership association called AAAIP, the Association of Animal Assisted Intervention Professionals. We also have the first certification, truly certification exam in the space for professionals who want to integrate an animal into their practice. So you can become a certified AAI specialist by sitting for this remote proctored exam. That's wonderful. So we're, we'll come back and we'll talk. We're going to unpack quite a bit, a bit there as well. Amy, could you, before we do that, could we um, have an orientation on EGALA? Sure. Um, so EGALA is an international nonprofit that trains and certifies mental health professionals and equine specialists to offer equine assisted psychotherapy um, or learning experiences. Um, we set standards. We provide education and we provide ongoing support for our members. We have about 2,500 members worldwide. We have members in every state in the United States and about 47 countries outside of the US right now we have membership in, um, or we have members who reside in and work out of. We have 750 programs worldwide right now actively offering the services. So I'm really excited to be here as well with all of you. So. Thanks for the opportunity to share. So you function as kind of an information clearinghouse, a training center, a um, methods and approaches uh, kind of kind of organization to help your members. And you also function as a community, right? Yes. So EGALA specifically educates, trains and educates professionals who want to offer equine assisted psychotherapy or equine assisted learning services. So EGALA as an entity does not provide services outside of the training experiences. We have a fundamentals training, which is a five-day experience. There are some, there's some pre-work and post-work for people to do as part of the certification program. And then ongoing continuing education that's required to ensure that all of our members are up to date with new, new and upcoming information that's relevant to the field. Then we have advanced certification and other kinds of trainings as well to offer. Let's talk about the nature of nonprofits and why the, the structure of nonprofits, the approach of nonprofits, enables these types of very valuable services to exist, right? If we had to think about profit at the end of a quarter, none of you would, would actually be able to sustain, right? I mean, your, your, your benefit is not necessarily a financial benefit to investors. It's changing people's lives. And that's sort of where you focus. You have to keep things financially stable. Um, how, do you, how do you create that balance where your financial st stability, Ed, is guaranteed so you can continue your mission, but your resources, your, your thinking is dedicated to the welfare of, of young people and the animals that are in your care? And Mark, we have a very unusual situation. We have a $44 million budget and 95% of it is funded by the New York State Education Department. And our founder was very wise and very creative to help school with 
HAI, human animal interaction. So we have to raise two to three million dollars per year to break even. And, and that's do you, do you ensure that the people who benefit from from um, from your services come from all different walks of life, all different income levels, um, all different um, conditions? How do you do that? Well, there's a couple of things. One is we have the biggest research project um, in the country regarding HIV at the University of Denver. It's a half a million dollar project. And we're really looking at how does interacting with animals in nature affect their ability to regulate themselves? Because most of our kids are highly dysregulated. And we're about four years into the project and seeing really good data. So that's something that's been really helpful when, we, when we're marketing our program, showing the data that there is a significant impact on the lives of our children. So again, and most funders are looking for data. And we also have a big vocational program as well. We know every child is not going to be a farmer or work on a ranch, but we're teaching those soft skills, being on time, dressing for success, following directions. Um, all of that really is helpful when we're out in the community sharing our story. And this regulation covers a whole bunch of different things, right? Executive function skills, time management, yes, yes, regulation, yes. impulse control, you know, those kinds of kinds of things um, that, you know, even getting up and making your bed and making sure that your room is clean and, and doesn't devolve into a, a utter, utter chaos, which, which makes uh, a live chaotic. So you're actually transforming, you're, you, you're providing a, a route to being a functional adult, aren't you? Yeah, and I guess the last thing I just want to mention, we're not a boarding school. So the goal is to develop those skills and go back to your home school district, go back to live in your community. It's not about spending 10 to 12 years at Green Chimneys. The average stay is two to three years. So it may be a bad business model, but it's a really good educational model to get kids out as quickly as we can. And we, the family is the key here, Mark. We work closely with the family with a lot of training programs in regard to that transition back to their home and their community. And I love that point about it may be a bad business model. But, you know, the, the real question this, this begs is, is what is the business of business, right? Because nonprofits are businesses. You operate in a very sophisticated way, right, Annie? I mean, you have to really manage your money very tightly. You have to think about the competencies that attach to each person that, that is part of your team. You have to integrate the team. You have volunteers. You have people coming and going all the time. You have different revenue streams. What is the business of business in America? What should that be? And I'm talking about not only the nonprofit sector, but really the, the business sector. Should we be thinking about good um, all the time, every day in our lives? Well, I don't, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on what the business <laughs> sector should be doing. If I uh, if I were, I might not be here today. But um, I just know for me personally, I can't imagine waking up every morning and my goal being to put more money in somebody else's pocket. I mean, that just wouldn't get me excited about getting out of bed. And it certainly wouldn't drive the team that we've assembled at Pet Partners to do the work we do. I think the secret sauce in a, a nonprofit organization is what passionate volunteers will do how much they'll contribute, what they'll give you of their time and their resources. I mean, if we had to pay those 10,000 volunteers on an hourly rate to go share their pets and share their animals with people in need, we probably couldn't raise enough money to do that. But these people are just passionate about, they know they have a special animal. They know that their animal can make a difference and they're passionate about getting out there and finding the right fit for them and their pets so that they can make a difference in somebody else's lives. And you add up those 10,000 teams making visits every week, week in and week, you know, week out, you know, you're talking about over 3 million visits a year. And that comes from volunteers who aren't expecting anything in return other than going home at night with their pet, knowing that they made a difference in their community. So, you know, I think that's, it's really ironic. I'm going to disagree with you because I'm going to bet that you do think every day about putting people, money in people's pockets. And I think that the people's pockets you're putting money in are your employees and the people who are, who are serving your purpose. The thing that I think is, is interesting about, about these civil society uh, organizations is that they do require leaders who have a very high degree of, of business competence. So, uh, Amy, and I'm sure this will be reflected in, in Ed's team and, and Annie's team, what kind of competencies are part of your team 
so that you can um, advance your mission, right? Because if you're getting up in the morning thinking about social good, but also about ensuring that people get their salaries and, and their paychecks and that they, they are retained and that they're happy, which is what every business leader thinks about, what kind of competencies do you have to retain in an engaged and positive way at EGALA? That's a great question. Um, you know, we really need people with high levels of integrity, people who are willing to do what it takes to work toward our global vision to ensure that people around the world have access to EGALA model services, um, to be able to limit conflicts of interest, potential perceived conflicts of interest, because a lot of us have our own businesses on the side as well, um, that we, we have to put EGALA first. Our mission and our vision have to come first all the time so that we can collectively move forward our mission and our vision. And that's something that our programs in EGALA have to afford to utilize a barn and rent horses or pay for the horses that they work with. So part of our support is helping our members learn how to, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, how to fund their programs so they can continue to provide services. And so for that well, reason- You're providing a kind of business counseling as well, aren't you? Definitely, a lot of business counseling in our work and a lot of support for our members. So that's a little bit different than some of the other nonprofit models. Um, we're, we're providing training and education and support so that they can find resources to support their programs. So you're functioning as, as a bit of an intermediary. Let's talk a little bit about um, from Green Chimney's perspective and Pep Partners' perspective, because you're direct services organizations. Um, what kind of transformation are you trying to engender? Ed, Ed talked a little bit about this before, so we're going to go to you, Annie. When you look at the two organizations that you described, right, the direct services side of people going with their pets to try and have an impact on somebody else, but also the professional association. What? How do you measure whether you are actually doing what you intend, that you're having the impact that, that you intend? And then I'd like to then go to you because you have also right a whole broad array of, of individuals with different needs, accountability to ensure that you're staying on target and that your investments are actually having the intended impact. It's a really tricky business. Annie, could you could you comment first on those two organizations that you described? Sure. I would say, you know, so we have uh, direct and indirect goals, right? We do fund research. So we're the, we're the serious therapy animal organization. We're very much interested in the research about why this seems to work. Um, and that while there's more research every year, it's still a very minimal amount. And there's a lot left to be done, too, in validating one person's research and showing that somebody else can get the same outcomes. So although the field's been around for a long time, Ed mentioned that as well, um, it's very um, uh, uh, childlike still in its infancy in regards to what we really know about the science as to why all of this works. So we also have some indirect. That's kind of is there a little bit of an attitude in society that that's kind of quaint? It's about pets and so on and so forth. We, We work with a number of different organizations, including organizations like Canine Companions for Independence and so on. And there there can be kind of a ignorance on our part, on my part, of the sophistication that this this, um, engenders. And it isn't just sort of a quaint kind of a thing. It it actually is is a very hard-nosed business that is about delivering specific benefit, right? Yeah, we talk about that all the time. It seems like a pretty simple press, press, um, premise, right? Take your pet to a hospital and visit somebody who's not feeling well. But it's actually quite complicated in terms of zoonosis, you know, making sure there's no disease transmission, uh, safety for the client, making sure that the animal's uh, welfare is, you know, tended to as well. So I'd say in addition to sort of those direct results of what a, how a visit feels, how does it make the client feel? If anything, I think we tend to over overscribe sort of the magic that we believe happens in some of these um, situations. The antidotes are amazing. You know, a child waking up from a coma because a dog, you know, got up in her face in a hospital bed. Um, a child who had been abused who wouldn't talk about the abuse to the therapist until they shared that the dog that he was visiting with had also been abused. And he reached out, stroked the dog's fur and said, it's okay, Bill and, Bill and I was hurt too. 
And then that was the first the child opened up and started talking. So there's a balance, right? There's a balance between the stories, the anecdotes, but also the research to really figure out where this goes as a field. Um, we also have indirect goals as well, though. And Amy, we were talking about this in the green room before we came on screen. You know, there's a lot of well-intended people who are anxious to get step into this space. Um, but there's a lot that we don't know we don't know. And the idea of protecting the client and protecting the animals, looking out for the animal's welfare is absolutely paramount. And we've got to come together as an industry and make sure we're championing the same thing and the same standards so we can all move forward safely um, and collectively. And then how do you deal with accountability? That, you know, in, in the mental health field, accountability is so difficult, right? Uh, trying to figure out how you're having the impact and optimal impact. Because if you have 100 clients, there are 100 differences, right? Each person is so individual. How do you, how do you deal with this? Is it, is it kind of a group getting together and from different perspectives and, and discussing options and then deciding? Or, or are there metrics? Um, how does it work over at Green Chimneys? Yeah, you know, the beauty of it is every child who steps on campus has an individual education plan, also known as an IEP, where they have individual goals, objectives, various resources they need to access, various therapies. So we look at those goals and we utilize our animals in many cases and gardens to achieve those goals. And we have quarterly updates. So there is a great deal of accountability in fact, school districts pay almost $300,000 per year to come to Green Chimneys. And most of those dollars are refundable via the state government, but it's a huge investment. So the school districts and the families hold us accountable. So it's all on that document. Every child has their own roadmap in regard to outcomes. And then at the end of the year, we review it for the fourth time and decide, is the kid ready to go back to the home environment? Is the kid ready to do a step down, maybe from residential to a day program? Can they go back to their public school or do they graduate? So um, the accountability is built in, which I'm very comfortable with. Does, how does it work with, in your environment? Because um, it would be very easy for a young person who has had a particular experience that is associated with, with their situation to look at going to Green Chimneys as a kind of punishment. Right. It's, it's, it's fundamentally different. Is, how, do, how do you deal with, with the intake process and, and how do you ensure that the entree to your environment? Well, again, prior to COVID, we were about as competitive as Harvard or Yale. Uh, we had about 1,200 um, applications for about 30 to 40 positions. So that worked, but that's kind of slowed down now, but based on, based on COVID. I've never met a child who's excited about coming to a residential program, quite frankly. So it's a process. We work closely with the family. We work with the school district. We do tours. We do an orientation. And most kids are still not happy. But the good news is once they get on campus, they have a favorite animal. It could be a bald eagle. It could be a camel. It could be a Clydesdale, again, whatever it might be. So well, that's that, interesting. You're using the human animal interaction to set the tone. You're not true. doing it with words. You're not you're not just alone sitting in a in a room and explaining stuff. Yep. Agreed. I mean, we had kids embrace our mini horses, as I said, the Clydesdales, Pergerons. I mean, whatever they're interested in, but the horses are a big piece, as the dogs and our birds of prey. The camels, we have three gorgeous camels, we have bacterians. So yeah, that that's a piece of the lore to come to the Green Chimneys. You're going to get your favorite animal or animals. Are we connecting in some way with something that we've left behind as we modernize the nonverbal aspect of, of ourselves as animals, of ourselves as, as beings? Amy, do you think that that... that, that this is part of the magic that we cannot recapture with another verbally oriented entity where we're going to communicate through speech or through sign. But instead, and it's not structured, it's very emotional. Is that part of the magic here? 
I think so. I, I believe that the horses, you know, again, a gala works specifically with horses. So um, the horses have a unique way of meeting every client where they're at and whatever it is that that particular client needs, somehow the horses fill that space and you're just seeing which horses end up showing up next to different clients and, and how they interact. And many of the clients that come to any gala program have been through talk therapy and it hasn't worked for different reasons. And there's just something special about working with the horses. Um, the horses don't need them to talk about it. They need them to be present. They need them to be authentic. And that takes time to shift into that, you know, into learning to be authentic and learning to be present. But once they can, the horses give automatic feedback non-verbally. So I, I believe that, that non-verbal piece is, is huge. So we're going to, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things. I'm going to give uh, Ed a word. And Annie, I'd, lo I'd love you to give the last word on the new organization that you're founding and how that might uh, be scaled to impact the entire sector. But I did want to want to mention um, that most people have had experience with service animals or support animals in some at some point. And the second um, uh, uh, question was, uh, what do you see as the most important benefits of animal-assisted interactions? And we, we required people to select three. And what was interesting is that we had uh, a, like a multi-way tie, communication between the individual and patient and, and staff and provided, increases self-esteem and brightens individual's mood, diverts attention away from pain and discomfort, uh, decreases stress in patients and clients being served, empowers individuals and environments where they might otherwise feel little control. It's 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 a very very broad set of benefits. It's not just one thing, which which is is really uh, interesting. So, um, Ed, could you just uh, give us a sense of of where you feel this sector and green chimney chimneys uh, in particular is going into the future, and how we might want to change our perspectives of human animal interactions in a way that could benefit both sides. Well, again, uh, the good news is we're planning for the next 75 years and our tortoise is the only one who's probably gonna benefit from the next 75 <laughs> years. But we, we have an institute here and part of it is, is training and passing the good word to others prior to COVID we get hundreds of agencies and individuals come in and observe. And again, to me, it's not necessarily magical. It's hard work. You got to be focused. And um, again, there are groups we're encouraging to embrace this particular model locally, nationally, and internationally. So we think we have a good model. I mean, it doesn't work for every child, obviously, but we believe our DNA, nature has been ripped out of our DNA. And this is a way to pour it back in. And for kids with mental health issues, it's really, I believe, central to their education, both socially, and, emotionally, and academically. And your point is that we all, in that respect, we all, in that respect, live with mental health challenges. And we all need to reconnect with, with our natural world and, and the other beings that live in that. Isn't that, isn't that part of your point? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> uh, Andy, could you could you take us out with with sort of uh, an explanation of how you intend to affect the entire field through this association that you've described to us? Sure. Thanks, Mark. You know, the work of Green Chimneys is incredibly well respected in this space. And the work that Amy does in terms of, uh, you know, interacting with horses has been around for a lot longer and much more mature. But the idea now that you might be able to find a, if you if you're looking for a therapist or you're looking for an occupational therapist and you might be able to find someone who specializes in animal assisted therapy and you might be able to book an appointment based on the possible availability of an animal being integrated into your treatment plan would be appealing to a lot of people who don't qualify for these other services and that's the future you know that's where professionals are headed whether they're passion people coming out of school with a social work degree and they want to understand how could they integrate an animal into their practice so that's why we launched the association of animal assisted intervention professionals to make it safe and doable and viable for all of us to have more exposure to pets at a time when we might need them and benefit from them the most. And now with these new technologies like Zoom and the, the, this interaction that we can take, we can build communities, we can transmit knowledge, 
We can then come together at, at physical facilities as well. So you're taking advantage of, of, of how we communicate today in order to create coalescence around this issue and knowledge around this issue. Dr. Ed Plake, Executive Director of Green Chimneys based in New York State, Annie Peters, President and CEO of Pet Partners in Bellevue, Washington, and Amy Blossom, CEO of Agala, the Equine Ass Assisted Growth and Learning Association based in Elgin, Illinois. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been a fascinating discussion that bridges so many different worlds. We so appreciate uh, your help. And then on Thursday, we're also gonna be talking about empowering AAPI uh, youth, uh, Asian American, um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander youth. These are all parts of what you're working on from a particular angle. It's so interesting how these, these topics inter interconnect and we're hoping to see you all there soon. Thank you so much for attendees. Thank your boards, thank your staffs, thank your donors, thank the government entities that are helping to support uh, your programs and uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.